My guest today is Matthew Renzi. Matthew, how are you, sir? Very good. Thank you for having me again. Yeah, it's great to have you back. It's great to see a friendly face, even though it's, it's virtual. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are you doing these days? Well, um, I'm spending most of my time at home right now doing uh, virtual consulting. Uh, yeah. And I'm still creating online courses as well, primarily on uh, software development practices, data science, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. You've been the data science guy for a long time. Yeah, the as far as uh, our software developer community, I seem to be known as the data science guy, and rapidly I'm becoming known as the AI guy. So, what's well, the difference uh, between data science and AI? What the, are those? Are is one a subset of the other? Or are they related in some way? Yeah. So the main distinction. Well, let's just let's look at the definitions of both and see how they connect. So, data science is essentially this idea of taking raw data and turning it into actionable insight. So you've got data, you have a human being, and they're making a decision with that data. Whereas AI is kind of the other side of this, where a machine is taking raw data and it's using that data in order to make some kind of action or decision. So in one case, the human's making the decision. In the other case, the machine's making the decision. And where these two fields intersect is essentially the area of machine learning, where we're essentially using data and statistics in order to teach the machine how to make these decisions and so AI is really this, this large space of essentially any machine that we program or that we can have make rational decisions based upon the current state of its environment to achieve a goal of some kind. Whereas, you know, the data science thing uh, side of it is more the humans making the decisions with uh, those data. Okay. And I understand you have a, a brand new course coming out on mm -hmm. uh, artificial intelligence. Tell me a little about that. So the new course is called uh, the AI Developers Toolkit. The idea uh, behind this course is that um, there's a lot of tools that are currently available to software developers. Many software developers don't know these tools currently exist. So I'm trying to essentially show software developers the current state of the entire software industry or the entire state of the AI industry uh, by showing them examples of tools that they can use today with very little code in order to solve a complex problem that you know, looks like it would take a, a data science team, a machine learning engineer, and a bunch of you know, AI systems to solve, but is really just a couple lines of code in a call, like a, a REST API call to a web service. Oh, it sounds simple. Sounds too good to be true. It does sound too good to be true. And in some ways it is, but um, for the most part, I believe we're entering a phase of this industry where regular software developers without any background in data science, machine learning, or AI can solve a whole series of problems now that they couldn't solve even a few years ago. The tools have now gotten to a point where it's just so easy to use. You Essentially, if, if you can work with an image, you can send that image to a REST API and then return you know, a classification of uh, what's in that image or the bounding boxes for the people uh, contained in it. You don't have to spend the time training these models anymore. This is all done for you by third parties like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. Yeah, I've worked with some of those tools. They are pretty amazing. And uh, mm -hmm. the simplicity of them is, is really refreshing. Yeah. Um, to, uh, tell me about some of the tools that are available as a uh, an AI guy. So the the course essentially covers um, covers the entire space of the AI tools, uh, starting with uh, tabular data. And there's both uh, data analysis tools and there's data synthesis tools. So we look at tabular data analysis and then tabular data synthesis. Then we go into text and look at text analysis and text synthesis, and then go into audio analysis, audio synthesis, and then image analysis, image synthesis then video analysis, video synthesis. And then we start looking at how to combine these things together into AI applications, and then eventually end up with uh, cyber physical systems, which is essentially hardware and software working together to solve these problems, like a self-driving car or a, a collaborative robot, something along those lines. Okay, you, you mentioned uh, analysis and synthesis in several of those mm -hmm. categories. What, what do you mean by that in this context? So analysis is where we take uh, complex high dimensional data and reduce it down to smaller, uh, more abstract data. So for example, if you take an image and you reduce that image down to a label, like this picture is a cat, the word cat is essentially the output. Where synthesis is essentially the inverse of that, where we take some, some simple uh, data and we expand it into some kind of more complex data. So for example, if you say, draw me a picture of a cat as a sentence and you feed that into a generative adversarial network, uh, that creates images, it will give you an image of a cat. 
So mm -hmm. you can think of them as the inverse of one another. One's taking complex data and simplifying it. The other one's taking simple data and making more complex uh, data from it. Okay. Yeah. And speaking of uh, simple to complex, I see the, the list that you just sort of rattled off. I'm, I'm looking at your slides now and AI mm -hmm. for tables, for text, for audio, for images, for videos, for apps, for systems. And that, that gets more complex as I go down that list. AI yeah. for systems is much more complex than AI for tables. And I, that was an intentional design decision with this course. I wanted to start with the simplest tools first so that people could really grasp the concepts and then work my way down to the more complex and, in my opinion, the more interesting tools as well. And the thing is, like, while many software developers have probably seen some of the older tools, like the, the basic tabular data machine learning, some of the basic text analysis stuff, um, when you get down to the, the more complex things like the, uh, you know, the audio, the images, and the video, like some of these things genuinely look like magic. My guess is yeah. there's probably about 80% of the examples I show in the course, most software developers will A, have never seen before, and B, think I'm making it up because it looks, it looks <laughs> literally like magic. But every yeah. tool that I show in this uh, is something I've either worked with in the past or at least created a small demo in order to, to show it off for the course. Oh, I like it. I think, was it Arthur C. Clarke who said that sufficiently advanced technology is indispensable, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from magic? From magic. Was that, that Clarke? I can't remember. I believe so, yes. Uh, yeah. um, it, well, I, you know, I, I'm not sure that I agree with you when you say that uh, everybody's worked with the tools for tabular AI. Can you describe some of those? Uh, there, there are probably people out there that have not worked them. Yeah, maybe and I should probably clarify. They didn't recognize um, them as such. Yeah, and I should probably clarify, um, not that necessarily that they've worked with them in the past, that they've at least heard of them or seen something on the internet, you know, on a Reddit forum about them. So but essentially, what are, what are the some basics, of those tools? Yeah, the basics like uh, tabular data classification, where we essentially take a, you know, a row of data in a table and we try figuring out what kind of thing it is. For example, like um, if we're doing uh, loan approval, we can look at a person's uh, you know, credit card history and determine how likely they are to repay their credit card. So we can classify them as approve this person or reject this person or mm -hmm. somewhere in between. And then there's a regression, which is where we essentially predict numerical outcomes using tables of data. So the typical example is, you know, if you're trying to predict how much a house will sell for, you can take all of the features of the house as a row of data and feed this into a regression uh, algorithm, and it will then produce the dollar amount that it thinks the house will sell for based on every other house it's seen and all of the features of those houses. And then beyond that, um, the other basic tool that pretty much I think almost everyone's heard of nowadays is recommendation engines. So essentially this idea that we can have an algorithm or a model predict what kind of content you'd like, what kind of products you'd want, based upon all of your previous purchase history and all of the purchases of every um, that have been made in that system so far. And these are getting uh, pretty good to the point where, you know, when you look at your Netflix queue, um, the movies that it's recommending to you um, are genuinely movies you might find interesting. And you don't have to go very far to uh, find product recommendations from Amazon that essentially match the kind of products that you're interested in. But those are the basic, uh, you know, tabular data analysis tools that okay. uh, I think most people have at least heard of in some way, shape, or form, um, whether they've worked with them or not. Okay. And as we get more complex here, we'll move down this list to um, uh, analyzing audio and images and video media. Mm -hmm. Now, that's yeah. harder, right? What kind of tools are available for that? Yeah. So when you move from tables down through text, you know, the, the tools get a bit more complex. And then as we get to audio, you know, we're starting to do things like um, speech recognition, where we're trying to turn a person's voice, you know, the uh, words that they're speaking into text that we can then process, um, you know, as uh, characters of text. Um, in addition, we can also do synthesis tasks, for example, uh, audio synthesis, where you know, we can, you know, uh, do text to speech and essentially take text and then have it spoken by the computer. And while most of those voices sounded very artificial and unnatural, we now have the ability to synthesize a individual person's voice. So for example, I have uh, voice models of my own that I can synthesize my voice saying things. Um, so for example, if I'm uh, recording a course and I, I say the wrong word somewhere, uh, I can actually go in and I can uh, change the text of my script and then synthesize my voice saying that word correctly. And it's, it's good enough now that I've used it on a few occasions. And really? I, I couldn't really tell the difference. I mean, I, I can tell the difference because I, I know what I sound like. You know, it's there. You know, we're looking, you know what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah, but when I'm listening to it play back, it's like, yeah, no, that, that genuinely sounds like me saying it. And it's getting better uh, every year. In fact, the change from last year to this year in terms of the technology is vastly improved. And um, this year, Microsoft is, uh, is uh, working on 
uh, their own generative models for voice that uh, will allow custom voice synthesis. And so that's my next step is to move from uh, the current models that I have in a third party uh, over into the Azure cloud. Oh, very nice. So if we're, we have no idea whether you're using that tool right now or if this is really you <laughs> this, speaking. Yeah, <laughs> this could be a deep fake. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> exactly. Uh, all right. And, and so Microsoft is building some tools built into Azure. What other kind of tools are available? Um, so image processing things, for example, trying to do uh, image classification, figuring out uh, what's contained in an image, uh, object detection, which is like image classification, but shows you the bounding box for the object. So like uh, if you look at, you know, it'd show my face is here and it would show there's a microphone down here and draw a little box around it. Uh, face recognition. So essentially determining my face versus your face in an image. Uh, facial characteristics, trying to determine what my facial emotion is, whether I'm happy, whether I'm sad. Uh, how old I am, we can do age regression. There's just a whole variety of image uh, analysis tools. And then on the image synthesis side of things, um, we can now synthesize images from scratch. So I could say, um, you know, draw me a picture of a bird with a yellow stripe uh, perched on a green leaf or green branch. Mm. And it will essentially synthesize an image that matches that description. It's not perfect yet, but uh, the change from just like a year ago to this year is so dramatic that by um, next year we'll be producing uh, real life images that will be almost indistinguishable from, um, you know, reality essentially. And uh, in addition to those image synthesis tasks, you know, we can do um, other kinds of tasks as well too, in, in beyond just um, beyond just uh, generating something from a textual description. We can do image style transfer where we can take a picture of me and then we can essentially apply the style of a famous painter and it will essentially hmm. paint me as if Rembrandt had painted it himself mm -hmm. in his his style exactly. It's it's actually pretty wow. impressive. Yep. Uh, you probably get Rembrandt. I'd get Picasso with my luck. <laughs> <laughs> well, who's building these tools? Are they commercial products that are available to the public? Yeah, so the three main vendors that are producing the kind of general purpose, off-the-shelf, ready-to-use tools are Microsoft, uh, Amazon, and Google. So they have equivalent um, you know, uh, cloud AI services right now that do all do pretty much the same kind of tasks. Once the industry has solved a problem, uh, they're very quick to get on board and to essentially implement this as a cloud uh, API of some kind. So you can essentially just make a REST okay. API call. You send the audio, the image, the text, whatever it is up to the cloud, and then it sends you the results right back. Um, the analysis tasks are much further ahead than the synthesis tasks in terms of these cloud APIs. And I think this is largely because the, uh, the analysis side is more of a solved problem and are typically have better business applications as well. Whereas the synthesis side of this is relatively new. It takes a lot more power to do it. Um, there's a lot of edge cases where it doesn't work great yet. And uh, there aren't as many business cases for it. So there's just not the economic incentive to put these in the cloud yet. But so you can either right. do these things through the cloud, through a third party um, provider. You can build these things uh, yourself, either using custom proprietary software or off the, or sorry, like uh, open source software. And then there's this kind of step in between where you can build hybrid models that essentially use an existing third party tool that's off the shelf. And then you transfer the learning in order to do a more specific task. For example, if we have an image classifier that's you know, trained to detect you know, various objects, we could fine tune that uh, using transfer learning to detect like your company's logo in an image. So it, it, it's going a step beyond its original intention to do something more specific. Is that what, what you mean when you say AI for apps is in taking something that's pre-built uh, and using it specifically to find my image or is it more than that? Or my um, it's a bit more than that. So uh, when I'm talking about AI for applications, I'm talking about this idea of, you know, like an AI model, you know, a machine learning model can essentially solve a very specific task. You know, you send the image in and you get uh, the name of the object out, you know, contained in the image. But sometimes you have to wire multiple models together to solve a more complex problem. For example, um, if I wanted to do a better job of detecting a person um, on in a, a, a Zoom call, um, I could both identify their face using a face recognition algorithm, but I could also identify their voice using a speak uh, voice recognition algorithm as well. So the combination of these two would increase the likelihood that I'm accurately classifying the person that's speaking uh, in the webinar call. And then yeah. other times you have to combine them by stacking things together. So for example, if you're trying to do um, object classification, which is the combination of image classification and object detection. 
you'd first do image classific or sorry, you'd first do object detection to figure out what objects are, you know, the bounding boxes of the objects in the, the uh, screen. For example, you draw a bounding box around my face and you draw a bounding box around this microphone. And then you'd send that over to an image classification algorithm that would then say, okay, the thing contained in this box here is a human face and you might be a face recognition. It would say it's Matthew Renzi and he's smiling. And then the second one would send this image uh, bounding box uh, to be classified and it would say it's a microphone. And so, okay. you know, combining these uh, tools in multiple ways to build more complex applications or to solve more complex app problems with software applications. Oh, sure. Uh, I, I could think of uh, analyzing video to see if certain people show up and if they're doing the things that they're supposed to be doing. Are they yep, using yep. the tools they're supposed to be doing, for example? Yeah, that would be human activity recognition, which interestingly is one of the video analysis tasks that we discuss. The ability to look at uh, either surveillance video or some kind of video footage and figure out, you know, for example, if it's a sporting event, um, you know, what kind of uh, actions the person is doing? Are they about to score a goal because they're running and kicking the ball at the same time towards the net? Um, which, you know, interestingly, in a few years time, there probably won't be human referees because these machines will be so good at accurately determining whether someone scored a goal or, you know, uh, raised a flag of some kind that the, the humans will just be there in the event that there needs to be a tiebreaker or something decision. I'll, I'll still be mad at them. I'll still disagree with them. Yeah. It, it will be interesting to see. At. It will be interesting to see what people yell at when there isn't a human referee <laughs> essentially making a call. The human will still probably announce the call because I think we intuitively want uh, human beings to make the final decision, but the data that actually determines whether a person, you know, um, committed a penalty of some kind will most likely come from some AI system that can see the entire field in a three-dimensional model uh, in, in ways that, that a human just couldn't observe that space. Interesting. And, and what about um, AI for systems? That's even more complex. Yep. So the AI for systems is the most complex thing we discuss in the course. And this is the idea that at some point in time, you move on from just a basic you know, text, image, audio, or video model, uh, move beyond applications where you're wiring these various models together in different ways to a cyber physical system, which is the combination of hardware and software that are connected, intercoupled or interconnected or intertwined in very deep ways. So thinking about like um, examples of cyber physical systems would include, you know, a, a robot that, you know, cleans your floor, a self-driving car getting you from point A to point B, or mm -hmm. a collaborative robot, a robot that you're working side by side with in a factory trying to assemble products or something like that. And so these cyber physical systems um, are quite a bit more complicated because they don't they don't solve a problem as a simple input and output like, um, say, an image classifier would. You just send it an image, you get an answer back. And it, they're more complicated than an application because they're not just software. Now they have to involve both software and hardware combined. And mm -hmm. they're even more complicated because they don't just solve the problem once. Um, they have to go through this loop uh, many times a second in order to choose an action based upon the current state of the environment that maximizes some kind of goal or achieves some kind of goal subject to a series of constraints. So it's uh, quite a bit more complicated, but I've broken it down in a way that I think is simple enough that any software developer can understand. And while I can't teach you how to, uh, to build these cyber physical systems in this course, because it's only a, about an hour and a half worth of lecture and about a day's worth of demos, um, it sets the stage so that if you do decide to go in that direction, uh, you have a mental model of how these systems now work. Hmm. Um, yeah, you mentioned uh, the idea that you're uh, many times a second you're evaluating new input, and that mm -hmm. I immediately start thinking of self-driving cars. So there, as you're driving down the street, people walk in front of the cars. The 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 sign the light turns red. There's all things they have to react to, respond to, and then make decisions based on that. And uh, I think um, I think that's what you're talking about uh, when you study yep. these systems. But um, the big one big challenge there is if you used a cloud-based service, then there's some latency and it'd be tough to do things multiple times per second. So how, how do you solve that problem? Yeah, so that's where we uh, kind of go to the edge computing scenario. The, the, the idea is that um, we can either have all the intelligence on the hardware itself, um, or we can try having the, all the intelligence in the cloud, or we do kind of a hybrid system where we essentially have the machine executing its loop based upon the model that it currently has. But then we send the data that is collected and the decisions that it's made and whether those decisions work well or not, we send that back up to the cloud. And then we use the giant you know, supercomputers in the cloud to churn that data and build new models. And then we send those models back down to the client uh, as kind of like a software update 
so that they're able to make better decisions uh, based on all the uh, scenarios and situations they've seen. And the thing you have to keep in mind is that this isn't just one machine building a model for itself. If we have a fleet of thousands of self-driving cars, they're all sending that data up to the cloud, including not just you know the state of the environment, but the decision that they made and how that decision affected the future state of the environment, whether it got it closer to its goal, got it further away or violated some kind of constraint. And then um, that builds new models that then get sent down to all of those thousands of self-driving cars. So whereas a human being can essentially learn, oh, I don't know, we probably drive for 50, 60, maybe 70 years of our life. Um, these machines are driving for literally thousands of years and all learning uh, at the same point in time. So you can imagine that the self-driving cars are going to rapidly improve in their ability to drive better than any human being uh, in a very short period of time. So, you know, within another 10 years, my guess is that uh, there will no longer be uh, a human being that is a better driver than uh, the best uh, AI machines. And it's probably actually sooner than that, but uh, I don't prediction. want to make any predictions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Is there anything we haven't discussed that we should have? Um, well, I think that, yeah, that pretty much covers the, the extent of the AI developers toolkit course. So yeah. now you go into more detail in your course. Where, where can people find your course? So the easiest way to find the course is just to go to my website, which is matthewrenzi.com. I've got a courses link and that has a list of all of my courses there. <clears throat> You'll find the AI developers toolkit at the top of the list. And then um, if you have a Pluralsight subscription, you can actually go right into Pluralsight and search for Matthew Renzi or the AI developers toolkit and find the course there. Excellent. I do have that. I will look for that. Excellent. Matthew, thank you so much for your time. You stay safe. Thank you for having me. Friends don't let friends give friends bad technology advice.